What you just saw was a preview of a small cooperative and developing village on the east coast of Demerara, known as Victoria. But it wasn't always that way. It took great strength and communal effort for the village to be what it is today. I am Rudolph Daly. And I'm Alexis France. Together, we'll be sharing with you the journey of how a group of people regarded as nothing work together to transform themselves and an abandoned plot of land into something. For more than 200 years, enslaved Africans of British Guyana worked on the plantations of white slave owners. They toiled under harsh conditions for more than 18 hours until they were tired and still found the strength to toil even harder while dreaming of a chance to be free. Fortunately for the enslaved, the rumors of emancipation that were circulating were soon to be confirmed. On August 1st, 1834, the enslaved Africans learned that they were free and the slave trade was abolished following the Abolition Act that took effect in 1834. But the joy of the ex-slaves would soon be short-lived. The plantation owners of British Guyana explained to them that they were required to work under a new system called the Apprenticeship System. Lost in our history is the fact that you know there was some type of emancipation the 1st of August 1834. True emancipation was 1838. Between 1834 and 1838, it was called an apprenticeship period. But fundamentally what it was, was another period of enslavement so that the landowners could recoup another 27 million pounds. The British government paid um, their, the owners of plantations 20 million pounds as compensation for emancipation for freeing about 800,000 slaves throughout the British colonies. But it wasn't enough. So they needed an apprenticeship period um, to get more out of the enslaved. And we've calculated that, the Carcom Reparations Commission, to be about 27 million. So people went to work for eight hours and then they were given overtime. But it wasn't very different. I mean, the rules were the same. Um, the brutality was left because um, of the British um, Parliament indicating that this was a period of transition from enslavement to freedom for the enslaved. Based on the Abolition Act of 1834, only the ex-house slaves were expected to be freed since they were to be apprentices for four years. The ex-field slaves, on the other hand, were expected to receive total emancipation in 1840 after being apprentices for six years. The period of apprenticeship was a lesser of two evils because enslavement or slavery was much harsher. Well, they planted crops um, to survive. Um, they, they worked on the plantations. They were also becoming more Christianized in a sense because they were being uh, taught by missionaries to believe in a, a British God, an English God, a white God. And they embraced that because during their trials and tribulations, their spirituality, which was taken away from them when they were brought from Africa, was replaced by Christianity. So they were working just as hard. They had more freedom. Um, they lived on or off the plantation and they were able to grow food. The ex-slaves also had the liberty to marry, which was not a privilege granted to them under the period of enslavement. On August 1st, 1838, the apprentices of British Guiana were released from their contract of apprenticeship and declared free men and women. With total emancipation, the ex-slaves were independent. They started to think beyond plantation life and about land ownership. This led them to purchasing the first village in British Guiana and sparked a chain reaction, which prompted the village movement in the colony. How did they do it? Well, 
they pooled all the money they earned while working as apprentices, as well as those gathered from farming and working on the plantations during and after the apprenticeship period. The 10,000 guilders that the ex-slaves paid was just a down payment. The total cost of Plantation Northbrook was 30,000 guilders. They saved and worked together and managed to pay down the other 20,000 guilders within 15 days of the first down payment. They renamed Plantation Northbrook to Plantation Victoria after getting permission from the Queen Victoria. Plantation Victoria later gained a village status sometime after 1853. I think it's important for people to realize that after 200 years of enslavement, here were people who were supposed to can't read or write, were able to come together and go back to their historical memory of community and buy land in a communal fashion. These purchasers came from five villages, nearby villages, and so it breaks the myth that Africans couldn't cooperate because they were different tribes. They came together um, and out of the historic memory, their DNA, which was communalism, they came together communally to buy a village, to buy a plantation, which they later transformed into a village. The two pillars they built it around were the church and the school. Um, most villages, those were the two things they wanted for, to build a church because of the importance of religion in their life and to build a school. The importance of religion in Victoria is still evident as the village boasts of 18 churches, but the churches weren't just used for religious purposes. Back in the days, these churches, they had a bell system whereby, because the, the churches, they're placed in close vicinities. So if there's an emergency, this church would, would ring the bell and the other churches will hear that song and ring their bell also and thus alerting the community of you know, any danger if the seawall is coming in because the first church is close to the seawall. We often only look at the buying of land and the renaming of Plantation Northbrook to Victoria. It was about economic independence, it was about identity, it was about self-governance um, because they created their own rules. They self-governed the document that um, they created among themselves, the 83 purchasers, you'll see that there was a high degree of sophistication. Victoria was credited with the first form of local government election. So that old system that was set, you know, to identify persons who you see can transform your communities and nominate and elect them, it was started right here. So Victoria was this stepping stone for 
a lot of development, you know, and a lot of laws because looking into the constitution itself and other forms where there's policies, a lot was drafted here. Today we can still find traces of the rich agricultural heritage in Victoria. Farming still remains one of the main sources of economic income. The business savvy nature of Victorians can be seen in the variety of businesses in the village. Whether it's small shops, welding businesses like that of Mr. Coffee, or ice cream stands, cleaning services, boutiques, nail technician services, and renting of chairs and tables, and a variety of other services. And last but not least, the many food vendors you can find at nearly every street corner. If there's one thing Victorians have in common, it's their pride to be Victorians. I'm Alexis Prince. And I'm Rudolph Bailey. Thank you for watching this documentary on the journey from Plantation Northbrook to Victoria. We are proud Victorians. My name is Anthony Samuels, and I'm a proud Victorian. We are, we are proud, proud Victorians. Victorians. And you gotta give me action and welcome. Mm. Give me a <laughs> Three, two, one. I see don't get it. Go back. <laughs> And I am Rudolph Daly. <laughs>